Hello, thank you very much. Um, I'm Janet, and this is Vicky. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to do the uh, section on water, and Vicky will tell us a little bit more about the connections with wildlife and water. Let's talk about water. Um, water comes from the sky. It's the rain. You know, that's where we get all of our water from. That's that's one thing that we need to think about. Is that rain is the important thing to think about. How much rain do we get in the UK? Well, as it turns out, and I'll explain a bit more in, in a moment, we don't get as much as we often think we do. This picture here on this slide actually is a 3D representation. Um, so the higher peaks are the places where you get most rainfall. And you can see obviously an awful lot of the rain falls on the west side of the UK. Uh, Wales and Scotland gets lots, and even across them. Bodmin Moor and Exmoor and Dartmoor get quite a bit. Hampshire and Isle of Wight, there's a few little peaks there, but actually when we talk about water availability, it can be related to the amount of people that we want to supply as well. So if you look at South Wales, so that's why I picked Swansea, because there's quite a lot of industrial areas around Swansea. We've got quite a dense population of 652 people per kilometre square, but the average rainfall is quite high, so it's it's over a metre um, rainfall on average in a year. Whereas if you go to Hampshire, then you've got less people, you've probably got less industry, but you've also got less rainfall. So when you're talking about water availability, you're trying to look at all of these things together to see how much water we've got available to us. This is something that the UK water companies and the environment agencies spend a lot of time and effort looking at. They have to manage their water resources to make sure that they know what the demand is going to change over the coming years and make sure that there's enough to go around. And this has been done quite recently, projecting into 2050. This was done in 2019. And at that time, they came up with a huge figure that we are going to be short of water by 3,435 million litres per day in the UK if we don't change the way we use water. So that's quite a significant amount. And then if you look at it regionally, and bear in mind that sort of rainfall figures that we saw on the first slide as well, the southeast of the country obviously has huge population around the southeast in London and the capital, um, but they also have that lower rainfall. Uh, Hampshire comes on the corner of that. That's the area where there's least water available for the amount of people and the amount of industry that we have to supply there. So we have to do something about this. Um, we cannot just keep you know, using water the way we do. We, we really need to do something, otherwise we will be short of a lot of water by 2050. Luckily, we're not going to do nothing. There are plans in place. Straight into chalk streams, this is what we're here to talk about. One of the places we get an awful lot of the water around in the southeast, especially around the, the Hampshire and into the Wessex area as well, is from the chalk aquifers. So when it rains, that rainfall soaks down through the soil, it replenishes the aquifers, and the chalk streams are very much connected to aquifers. This is why they often don't run at all in a dry summer, and if you've had a dry winter, there are sections of chalk stream that will um, run dry because of, they are very, very closely linked to the aquifer levels. And all of that lovely weed that's growing in it, that's called water crowfoot, and that helps, obviously, because it's photosynthesizing in the river, it's adding oxygen to the river. You just have to remember that every time we turn a tap on, it's quite possible that that's where the waters come from. It's out of those beautiful chalk stream habitats. So let's talk a little bit about water cycle. We mentioned that you know, the rain comes down, it soaks through the soil. As gardeners, this is where we can have quite an input. We are actually partly managing the water cycle within our garden. I'm sure we've all looked at the water cycle when we were back at school. And quite often, you find that water cycle diagrams don't include the plants, which I find a little bit surprising. Um, so we talk about water running off of buildings and roofs and ending up in rivers and going back out to the sea and then evaporating again. But plants have a really big role in this. And so as gardeners, we can help to manage that. So basically when it rains, um, the first bit of rain falls on the plants. And so if you've got um, a, a large canopy, like in a rainforest, then an awful lot of the rain never actually reaches the soil at all. It really just gets onto the canopy and it evaporates off in warm weather. 
if it carries on down through to the soil, then what helps it get into the soil is actually the roots themselves. So the roots will form these sort of runs and allow the water to infiltrate down through. So when you've got plants, you've got much better chances of infiltration and rain getting down through into the aquifers. In that root zone, you've then got those roots that are going to be taking up nutrients that are dissolved in water. And so on its way down through the soil, the plants are actually doing the job of cleaning up the water as well. So we don't end up with too much nitrate-rich water or phosphorus-rich water when it does get to the aquifer. So the plants are doing a, a pollution job for us as well as actually helping the water get down through there. But then if it does go on further, past the root zone and into the aquifer, that's where it's then stored until it ends up feeding things like those chalk streams that uh, we showed you. When it stops raining and the plants need to use that water, they're then taking that water out of the root zone and they're evaporating it back into the atmosphere so that it can float off downwind and go and rain on somebody else. Having a bit of an understanding that what we want to do in our gardens is make sure that that water gets into the soil really easily and percolate down through the soil. If we're using water irrigation, then what we want is for that water to stay in the root zone so that that's the important place where the, the plants can then use the water. So it's just important to sort of think about that when you're watering plants to make the maximum use and most efficient use of the water we use. I should have said, actually, I, I spent the last three years with the RHS and Cranfield University, and we've sort of been developing these ways of trying to help gardeners make the best use of water in the gardens. And one of the things we ended up doing is creating this website called Mains to Rains to help people switch from using mains water over to rainwater. And when you talk about water saving, what everybody thinks of is water butts, and we just wanted to make sure that we cover everything else as well as water baths, they are a major help in the garden. But there's so many other ways that you can actually change the way you, you garden in very simple ways that means that you are less reliant even if you've got water bath. So um, it just makes better use of the rain. So we ended up with this website. It's still live and available, and you can go on there and you can find lots of links to the RHS uh, advice pages. But basically, we've ended up with 10 top tips to say how we can help gardeners and we sort of categorise those into slow the flow, healthy soils, roots really matter, as we've just mentioned, in the water cycle, and collecting the rain. So those are sort of the main themes of what we want to do. So rainwater is better for your plants. It's also better for us because it's free. You know, we don't have to pay for it. Whereas if you're on a water meter, you always have to pay for mains water. You have to pay for your water even if you're not on a meter. So... We can get it for free, it falls from the sky, and we just have to get better at hanging on to it. It also is zero carbon emissions, so if you think about it, that water needs to be treated, it needs to be pumped to your house. There's an awful lot of chemicals used to make it clean, we put chlorine in it to make sure that it's clean and, and safe to drink. And so all of that takes energy, and if we're using rainwater, it also means we've got zero carbon emissions from the water we use in our gardens, which is going to be a great thing at the moment. Uh, roots tend to work better at slightly lower pHs, and that's all to do with the way they take up nutrients. Whereas maize water needs to be kept slightly alkaline because if it was acidic, it would start to dissolve some of the metal plumbing that we have in our household. So maize water is always artificially adjusted above 6.5, so it's not the ideal pH for plants anyway. Obviously, it works really well, and very often you'll find that the soils themselves will adjust the pHs but it's always better to use rainwater if you've got it available. So again, it's that balance of acidity and also the minerals that you might find in mains water, like the chalk, like the calcium and magnesium, that can give you that high pH, and that can reduce the nutrient availability for some plants. So onto our 10 top tips. This is all available on that Mains to Rains website if you want to go and have a look in, in more detail later. And please do, because it, what it does for you is that it will give you estimates of actually how much water you will save. If you go on there and you can say, say the size of your garden, you can tell, say what features you've got in your, your garden and which of these things you could possibly aim to do in your garden. And then it will give you an idea of how much water you will switch from maize water to rainwater. That ultimately will help crown foods. So crown food is still 
working on some of the research for this, and it helps to direct them as to where we need to work with gardens more. The top one, water bus, it's the obvious that everybody talks about. I'll, I'll say a little bit more about those in a moment. Actually, the biggest one is watering lawns. I'm sure if you're keen gardeners, you're not you're not going to be watering lawns. But I think the thing to remember with, with using a hose on a lawn is that if you use a hose for an hour, it's almost the same as inviting an extra person to stay in your house for a week. So the amount of water that somebody uses in a week is gone on a lawn in an hour. So it's a massive draw on those resources. And um, if you don't do that yourselves, then please do spread the word that water in lawns is just not necessary. A lawn will go brown, but actually grass is an amazing plant and it's got this a suicide um, mechanism, if you like. So it, it sacrifices all the top growth and everything goes brown and it looks like it's dead and it's not. The grass underneath the roots will grow again once it starts raining and that's how it survives the drought. Just placing a drip tray underneath the pot is really simple. What that does as well, it not only just catches that bit of rain, it does rain, but it helps you to understand how much water you need to water your plants. So if you water your plant and if you end up filling up the saucer, leave it. If you go back the next day and it's still full up, we were probably over watering because that plant hasn't used any of that water. If you go back in an hour's time and all of that water has got sucked back up into the flower pot, chances are you weren't watering enough. So a saucer under your pot not only helps catch that rain, but it also helps you understand how much watering you need to do. Whereas if you didn't have a saucer, it just runs away and you've got no idea. Mulch, I love mulch. Mulch is the absolute answer to everything in the garden, as far as I'm concerned. Whatever the, the problem is, the chances are that if you mulch something, that will probably help it along. What a mulch does from a water protective perspective is it stops the surface evaporation. Whereas bare soil tends to lose a lot of water through evaporation of the surface because it's dark, it absorbs the heat and sun. And adding a mulch gives you that sort of aerated, almost an insulation layer that helps to cool the soil, keeping the moisture in, and um, it also suppresses the weeds. So an organic mulch is, is brilliant. Similar, but not quite as good, is adding compost into the soil. So it's not quite as good because what it does is it still leaves that bare soil surface and so you still get quite a bit of um, evaporation. But it does help to um, put organic matter into soil, which then means that there's an awful lot of the bacteria and the fungi that live in the soil that will feed on that organic matter. And they then produce what I call natural swell gels and they will help to hold water in the soil. Switching from a hose pipe to a watering can, it can sound like you know that's going to create more work for me. But actually, what, what happens is because you've got to carry out water and because you can direct that water at roots much better, you become a much more efficient waterer. So even if you're using a, a tap and you are still using mains water, you become a much more efficient waterer if you use a, a watering can rather than having a hose around. Self-watering containers, now there's something that I don't think we talk enough about and we don't use very much. So you can buy them ready-made as, as hanging baskets and uh, patio pots. The, the little picture there is a thing called auto pot, which is intended for a greenhouse. But basically they've got a reservoir that's down underneath the root zone. They work really well. I did a bit of trial in the yard chest with them and they worked really well. And it means if it does rain, then the reservoir gets filled up from the drainage through the soil. So you're not only capturing the water, you're capturing nutrients that would otherwise leach to rain. This is a big one as well. Choosing the right plant for the right place. I get really quite irritated at people talking about drought tolerant plants, but then don't talk about soils because what you've got to do is match plants into the conditions that they really want to grow in. For example, you try to grow something like a salvia, which is really well adapted to growing in chalky or sandy soils. So it's got very deep roots. If you try and grow that in clay soil, it's not going to be a drought tolerant plant because it really can't get the air that it needs for its roots, which is what they're, they're used to growing in when you've got those light sandy soils. Choosing the right plant for the right place. If the place to find out what the plant, what right plant is, is to use the RHS plant finder. That's really helpful. So you can choose the soil type, you can choose whether you've got shady or sunny places, get the right plant growing in the right place and it will just thrive and it won't need anything like as much effort from you to use water on it. 
The last two are about paving. So when we put paving in our gardens, we obviously block in the soil. So the soil underneath that paving no longer can accept rainwater. And also it can't accept the organic matter that would normally rain down. You know, it would be autumn when the leaves fall off the trees. So without the organic matter, you're not going to get all the animals and the soil microbiology and the diversity that lives in the soil. So that soil is going to be really not capable of holding on to, to moisture. And so what we've got to do is make sure that we um, boost up our other areas where we are growing to, to capture that water if we can. Permeable paving does help, so at least it does allow the water to get into the soil underneath. And then if you've got plants growing alongside a, a path edge sort of thing, then that water can become then available to the plants that are growing alongside the path. Um, Depaving, obviously, the more paving you've got, the worse it's going to be. So if you can allow a little bit more space for plants and not so much for paving, it means that the water can get into the soil. And don't forget, all of our gardens are still providing some of that root for the water to get down to the aquifers so that it can do the root around the water cycle back to our houses and through our taps. That's a quick run through the 10 sort of top things that you can do in your garden. If you want more detail of that, then it's all still in that Mains to Rains website with loads and loads of links to more detailed gardening advice. People always think that, oh, I haven't got room for a water bath or I've only got room for a really tiny one. But what you can do is you can move water around your garden. If you've got a relatively flat garden, you can use siphons to move water wherever you like. So, for example, um, this water bath on the, on the right-hand side has got the downpipe going into it with the water going in. But it's connected to the other water bath by this just filled up hose. So that will act as a siphon. And as the water goes into the, the one on the right, it will automatically fill up the one on the left as long as that hose is completely full up with water. And it'll act like a siphon. So when you then come and take water away from that, that water bath, then the water will come back down the hose. You can stick it with another water bath wherever you like, as long as it's reasonably level. If it's on a different level, obviously the, the siphon will only work to how much height you've got left in the water bath. When we created the Mains to Rains website, we also had the opportunity to go to Chelsea Flower Show and demonstrate these ways of saving water in the garden. So it was great. We had a display in the discovery zone. There are a couple of YouTube videos of it, so you can see more of it there. But instead of having a water bath, what we did was we used a dipping tank. So what you've got here is a picture of a galvanized tank, which is completely full up, but it's actually sat on a metal grid, which has been covered with pebbles. And underneath that tank is another reservoir. So you've got an underground reservoir, which is much bigger than the one that you can see above. What we had was a little pump that was bringing the water up. We had it in the gutter to make it look like it was raining coming off the roof. But actually what you could have is just the pump bringing the water back up to the tank. And that would then um, mean that you can have a lot more volume, but only a small volume on show in the garden. And it means that you can keep that surface tank topped right up all the time which means that there's much less chance of wildlife getting caught in it because the wildlife will sort of drift towards the edge of the pond and scrabble out over the edge. And it also means that that moving surface deters mosquitoes. So if you really don't want a water butt, but you want to collect rain, this is quite a nice way of doing it. And it stays aerated. That's another thing with water butts. They can go a little bit smelly because if you've got to try to off your roof, they can start to rot in the butt and then it goes a bit smelly. The natural world doesn't have water butts. So what does the natural world do to store its water? It stores it in soils. Soils with lots of organic matter really do hold on to moisture, partly because of fungi. So this is a photograph here of partly digested leaves, which I found in my compost tape. I was quite pleased with this one. So you can see these lovely long white threads that are just going up through these leaves they will stretch much, much further than roots do. And there's a relationship between the fungi and the roots. These fungi can actually get right into the roots of the plants. What the fungi gets from that is actually, it does take some of the sugars and some of the starchy materials that the roots produce as food for itself. But in exchange, it will take things like phosphorus and water back to the plant. So this growth like this, don't, um, don't be worried, that's actually a really good thing. 
you've got all of these things living in your soul. What they also need is air. So they, they are respiring just like any other organism, and you do need air for those things to happen. Um, by adding organic matter, what you get is this lovely crumb structure, which means that you've then got those air spaces. And that helps the biodiversity to not only respire a lot, but then you've got all these little like miniature reservoirs that when it does rain, that's what helps the infiltration. So all these little reservoirs can fill up and then slowly drain on through down, down through the soil. Uh, no dig is a relatively new technique, but it makes so much sense when you think about it. If you're going to dig your soils over every year to plant things, then what you're doing is breaking up all these lovely fungal mycelium. So if you can keep those intact, then that really helps to keep that method of, you know, obtaining more moisture for the plants using the fungi with no dig methods. You just add more organic matter to the surface of the soil so that it, all those sort of worms and the, the springtails and all the things that live in the soil will, will go and drain that organic matter into the soil for you. There's a lot of talk about nutrient lockup with compost and things. So if you've got compost that isn't completely composted, obviously the little organisms that are eating it are using those nutrients themselves. So when there's a lot of fresh organic material around, then they need those nutrients and they too tend to use them up. So it's not until they've used up all those nutrients and then some of that biodiversity may be dying off and those then those nutrients then become available again to the plants. Not completely composted material can reduce the amount of nutrients available, but as long as it's it's left over a whole season to compost down, then things tend to sort of balance themselves out. All of that organic matter that you add, you end up with those healthy soils, which then creates that natural swell gel, which then helps to, to hold on to water. Um, if you're not into making compost, I, can, I, I know some people think it looks a bit messy and it might encourage um, things like rats. It's all wildlife. They all have a job to do. If you're not into compost, one of the things I would encourage everybody to do is cut leaves in the autumn. Leaf mould is the most wonderful compost. It takes a little bit longer because the leaves are quite hard. They tend to be more lignin. But one of the things we took to Chelsea to show this was this beautiful willow woven leaf mould container. We designed it specially and had it made specially. I'm, I'm not sure I've seen one before like this, but it's got a hole in the front. It also had a hole in the bottom so you could get the kids to stuff it full of as many leaves as you could find. Lots of air spaces through all the willow weaving to help the fungi get in there to break the leaves down. And then the hole at the bottom would mean that, you know, in, in a year or 18 months time when it's all started to rock down, you can just pick the thing up and give it a really good shape and all the lovely leaf mold will, will fall out at the bottom. If you don't want to go into something as creative and, and artistic as that, really, if you know what a dead hedge looks like, then you can quite easily make a little bit of a dead hedge uh, system go and collect the leaves, and, and that will rot down beautifully, and you'll end up with the most lovely compost, and it all helps to, to keep water in the, in the soils. And obviously it's peat free. Um, I'm sure we all know about peat and why we shouldn't be using peat. So this was one of the one of the display boards we had at Chelsea, um, Roots Matter. This was to try and get across this idea that when you're using water, you, you can't really do water without thinking about soils. Soils are really important to, to understand what you have. Hampshire Isle of Wight area tends to be quite chalky, um, but I'm sure garden soils have been very well improved. And I think the thing to look at here is this little cube of soil at the top that's just getting the rainfall on it. So if you get four inches of rain, so 100 millimetres of rain, type of soil you've got will determine how deep that rain might go through the soil. So if your soil is clay, it's only going to penetrate the first 25 centimetres, and that clay soil can hold that amount of water in that top 25 centimetres. But if you've got sandy or chalky soil, which you might well have around the Hampshire area, then four inches of rain can go as deep as a, a metre down. And that means that there's much less moisture in the surface layers. But what you've got to do is match your planting to those sort of plants that have got really deep roots that can get down and reach that um, moisture that's been held down in those sandy chalk soils. That's a really big advantage when it comes to a drought because if you've got those deep rooted plants, that water is still down there. It's going to have a minimal 
loss through the surface vibration. So that's actually a, a, an advantage. So yeah, some obvious things on there as well. So shallow roots, you need frequent water in because it's buffering off the surface. Deeper roots have got access to more moisture. Slowing the flow. So by slowing the flow, what we mean by this is that we want to slow everything down so it's got a chance to soak in and actually travel sideways. So we don't want water to run off of paving and end up away from our gardens. We want it to come down to the soils and hopefully go a little bit sideways. This was the display hood, Chelsea. And basically what this is, is permeable paving. So that gravel section on the left-hand side is actually absolutely rock solid. And it's been stuck together with a polyurethane um, polymer system, uh, but it drains really well. And it goes down into that section underneath, which is actually um, made of black plastic. It is burying plastic in the ground, but we've got an awful lot of plastic around and we do tend to be ending up putting it into the ground. We might as well make it do a useful job for us. But it's got a capillary mat between that black plastic structure, the reservoir underneath, which then allows the water to be soaked back up into that root zone where you can see plants growing. So you've got reduced flood risk by allowing the water to infiltrate through that paving, but then you're also taking that water back for plants as well. Cranfield University did some work on how much it rains and what a typical rain event might be in the UK. And they found that 95% of all rainfall events tend to be 27 millimetres of rain or less. Now, I know in the future, with climate change, we are going to see changes to that. But on average, at the moment, when it rains, we get 27 millimetres of rain or less. So it's just over an inch, basically. So if you've got space to attenuate an inch of water in your garden, then the chances are you're doing a really good job at reducing the risk of flooding for both yourselves and your neighbours. I just wanted to mention connections between water and wildlife and how water creates biodiversity. Obviously, the obvious thing is that nothing lives without water. Everything needs water to survive. In my garden, I'm not only growing the pita, which is this tiny little plant in the middle there, but I also grow an awful lot of bindweed. I've changed my attitude to bindweed. I always used to battle with it and treat it as a weed and get really depressed. I could never get rid of it. And now I'm really relaxed about it. It's a great plant because what it's got is really deep roots. When you get a really dry spell, you'll notice that the bindweed is always the last to wilt. But actually what it's doing is it's bringing up humidity from deep layers of the soil. So it's helping the plants that grow around it. Um, it's also bringing those nutrients up. So what I do pull it out, I put it on my compost heap. I let it wilt first or I put it in a bucket of water to drain it before I put it on my compost heap. And all those nutrients are then brought from deep underneath in, in the ground to the surface again for my plants to use. It helps me grow Nepeta because it shades the soil. So I take the top bits of it off and I let it just shoot at the bottom and it helps to shade the soil. In a way, it's sort of like a green mulch, so it's, it's protecting the soil from evaporating moisture. And creating those damp places, it means you also end up with a few snails. Well, and caterpillars, as you can see, are found on the bindweed. And once you've got caterpillars and snails, then you start bringing in birds and you start bringing in bats because you've got moths from your caterpillars. You know, you start with water, you have to go through that route of having bindweed, but actually you end up with the wildlife, which is all also great to, to watch in your gardens anyway. So yeah, I've changed my attitude to bindweed. I use it as a cover crop, I use it as a compost crop, and um, celebrate the, the wildlife that comes with it. A little bit about ponds. So I've got a picture of a pond here, which is a fairly typical garden pond, but there's a few features that are not great from a wildlife point of view. First thing is fish. If you've got fish and you're feeding them, what you're doing is you're adding nutrients to your pond. And if you haven't got masses and masses of plants or you've got some sort of filter system, then those nutrients have got to go somewhere and you will end up growing algae. The algae then respires, that takes the oxygen out of the water, and then that means that other wildlife will really struggle because the oxygen levels will be reduced. When it comes to algae and ponds, then it is absolutely about balancing um, nutrients with plants. 
actually they're taking nutrients out of the water and they're, they're using those nutrients to create that biomass that's growing out of the water. So rather than growing an algae, they're growing plants that you want to grow. So if you have a problem with algae, I think my first um, suggestion is get more water plants in there. Sloping sides on ponds are not only really important for wildlife to get in and out, but it also means that when you get a dry smell, the pond won't look out of place if the water levels don't hit. You can allow a bit of evaporation. You need to be careful of, for, to, to make sure there's enough water for the wildlife. But actually, allowing the levels to, to, to reduce means that you don't have to keep topping it up with, with water from the mains again. So what's the point in having a pond um, and keeping that habitat fresh in your garden, which means that you're depleting that habitat that's out in the, that beautiful chalk stream that we saw earlier on. If you have got the rainwater available, then topping ponds up with rainwater is always a really good idea. So let's say we've had a lovely warm spell and it's been really sunny, we've got a bit of a breeze and all your plants are looking really sad and wilted and you don't actually notice them until they start to wilt. And then you panic and you think, oh my God, my plants are wilted, I'm going to give them a really good drink. So then you put loads of water on them. And then what has happened is your plant's roots have slowly started to die off. So if your plant is wilted, chances are that some of the roots have died already. And if it's really bad, then some of the leaves might fall off as well. So you've lost a few roots, you've lost a few leaves, and you've sloshed a load of water on, on it, and you've saturated the soil again. So everything should be fine. Actually, it's not always that, that easy because once the plant's lost its leaves, it then doesn't have that facility to uh, re remove the water from the soil. So that water is just going to sit there and it's going to lose its oxygen. The soil microbiology is still working in there, even if your plant's not doing quite so well. The weather's warm, so they're going to be really happy and they're going to be working away at a really high rate and they're going to use up the oxygen. And then you haven't got enough oxygen left for your roots to regrow. And this is what we call water logging. The plant needs that oxygen to regrow its, its roots, and they're now short of oxygen. They're quite warm, and oxygen is less soluble in warm water as well. And when you've got a sick plant, so often people will say, well, just water it and, and give it a good feed, and it'll be fine. Part of the reason it's now looking sad is because it was initially dry, but now it's saturated, and what it needs to do is dry out again. And you just then go and put more water on it, and then you give it some feed, and it hasn't got the roots to be able to deal with that feed, and so it's going to get even more upset. One of the best bits of advice, I think, is, is to try and avoid getting your plants to go sort of swinging from really dry to really wet, but just keep them slightly moist all the time. The way I used to talk about it was to say, you know, you just got to keep the glass half full. You don't need to top it up right to the top all the time. The moisture doesn't have to be topped up all the time. It really does need to be just moist, but without letting it dry out and, and seeing that real time. So now we're over to Vicky, who's going to explain a little bit more about water and how it connects to wildlife. My job for the past 20 odd years has been really to advise people on how to make their garden more interesting for wildlife, how to keep wildlife in their garden, namely hedgehogs, because it's the most common mammal we have. I work in a wildlife centre in mid-Somerset. We get hedgehogs from the whole of the southwest because there aren't that many uh, wildlife centres really there. So I just came up with some ideas that will help create biodiversity in the garden, basically, uh, which is more for us to look at when you're looking out the window or if you're in your garden then you have um, more interest basically. And ultimately that's what we're all trying to achieve is more life and more opportunity for wildlife. So this is obviously a bog standard bird bath on a pole above ground, which is gonna be great for a lovely group of starlings to come along and have a splash. And it's really nice to see, and it helps keep their feathers clean and they need to do it in order to keep in good order. This kind of bird bath is really good for people who've got maybe a small garden or you've, you've got a window that's looking out onto a small area and you need it raised up so that you can actually see what's happening in it. And if you had it on the ground, you would miss all that. So that's perfect for that. It's great for people who maybe can't bend down to clean out a water source. You are providing water for 
birds and invertebrates will come down bees will come and drink from that as well and other insects too that all need all need water so it's a lovely start so then if you were to put some water on the ground you're gonna make it able for hedgehogs to come and drink from the groundwater also birds will come down and use that as well because it's accessible and if they feel safe enough they're going to use that too so if you can have both levels that's great the more different types of uh, water features you can have in your garden the better i think so hedgehogs what's not to like they're just really such nice animals we don't all have them in our gardens because they died out in many places of the fragmented habitat has stopped them passing in such a large areas. What happens is they hibernate, obviously, wake up every nine to 12 days out of hibernation. It's not a constant sleep like some people think. When they do wake up, they often would build a new nest, but one of the requirements that they really do need is um, they have a good drink. They're not likely to be able to find any food in, in midwinter. Um, unless they're spending lots of energy looking for it. And lots of people have got feed stations nowadays, and that's really helpful. But having water down all year round, not just when it's hot, is really, really useful for hedgehogs. You know, this is another non-permanent kind of source of water that you're going to probably clean out and refresh and top up, hopefully, with rainwater, else John will be after you. Um, the next stage up would be if you had a permanent creation, like a tub, these tubs here don't have any steps up the side, but you can put bricks up to, up to the side, fill them a bit higher with water, have uh, lots of plants like they have got in them there, but um, these are going to wilt in the winter, so you probably need some kind of ramp. Um, you can put chicken wire around a plank of wood um, to have it down the side there so that you're just not going to drown any hedgehogs. And, you know, this is another form of uh, water feature that is actually going to create much more life because it's always there and you're not going to be cleaning this out and it's going to attract invertebrates as well and I've got a small tub like this and I do have water profit in it which is where the picture of the frog is in amongst it when it's flowering it's it's a really nice pollinating plant as well if I was going to put a pond in and I was on my own I think the most easy option to think of would perhaps to be able to get hold of a, an old bath and dig that into the ground. It's nice and solid, and uh, you don't have to mess about with a liner and maybe cover the liner because blank patches of liner at the edge can get very hot in summer, especially if you've got small toads and frogs coming out of it, um, and it can dry them out really quickly. So here's the obligatory pond that obviously I'm going to mention if I'm talking about water in gardens. There's some really nice high plants up around the edge of it. They're going to create shade on the water. You don't you don't want to create your pond uh, anywhere where it's really shady anyway. Um, you're going to have to have sun sun on it so that you get more life in it probably because uh, it's going to have to have warm areas in the water and uh, around the shallow edges. Hopefully that you're going to create that's easy accessible for birds still to be coming and splashing about and hedgehogs to be coming in and having a drink safely and whatever else. I mean it. You know, it just depends where your garden is. You can have boxes, badges. Cameras are great for that. To fi finding out who is using your pond is, um, and garden is, is the only way. But it does kind of dull your senses because then you, you maybe are not looking for the tracks and signs so much if you're only relying on, on wildlife cameras. I mean, in my job, it's just full of knowledge of poo, really. So if you, if you know what hedgehog poo looks like, then you, uh, you know when they're about. I put in a bit about um, pond furniture because it's the way I wanted to describe it. If you were to have like a really solid perch, so I mean, you're not likely to have kingfishers visit your garden pond, but say if you were near a lake or a stream or a river, kingfishers do have the odd tendency to come into people's gardens, especially if there's a lot of flooding in the rivers because the, the river spreads out over fields and the fish spread out and the water is also very muddy. So there have, there have been occasions where kingfishers do visit people's gardens and they like a nice solid perch because if they are going to um, nick stuff out of the pond, they need to probably try and kill it if it's, if it's a wriggling fish or, you know, minnow or something that's, that's too wriggly to swallow. They need to whack it on 
out on the uh, post a bit there. And also, I was going to say about Kingfish is if you haven't ever seen one or you want to increase your um, likelihood of seeing them, um, I definitely advise listening out for what their call sounds like. It's a really solid whistle as they fly along the, over the top of the river normally or, or just skirting around the edges, cutting the corner. But that will definitely um, help you because you can detect that noise if you're listening out for it, if you know what to listen for. You may get a much better view of one as it whizzes by um, rather than thinking you saw a blue blur whiz past. But um, it really does help. And this one in this particular picture is a male because the top and bottom beak is black. In a um, female, the, the lower mandible would be red. And I always remember it's kind of like lipstick, you know, like a female might wear lipstick. It's probably, probably out of date kind of saying that kind of thing now. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's a good identification uh, feature. Other forms of pond furniture would be tall um, reeds where a uh, dragonfly or a damselfly would have hatched out. They need to crawl out onto these dry areas so that they can... Um, pupate into the adult forms so you need all mixture of different layers of pond plants really and also it increases the amount of um, flowering plants you can have in your garden and different types of things obviously need aquatic places to live not just our gardens and dry land this is a hog fly lagoon the good thing about this is that it really doesn't have to be pretty it's a chopped up milk bottle or just anything really you can use. You don't need anything too big. You fill it full of water and then you put um, some leaves in it. It's going to be pretty stagnant water. The picture of the whole fly larvae at the bottom here, uh, they're called rat tailed maggots. And I don't know if you've ever come across them in any stagnant places that you've had in your garden, like um, upturned um, bin lids and stuff like that. I've, seen them in places like that before. They've got this long tail that actually gets a lot longer than what it is there. And um, they breathe through this. So they, this hog, this particular hog fly in the picture, the adult here, is not, I don't think, one of the types that lays its, uh, lays its eggs in water. I, I don't know what, what particular types of hog flies lay their eggs in these pots. I know that there's some very common ones that we all get in our gardens that would utilize this kind of lagoon. You'll need to put twigs in it so that when these rat tailed maggots pupate, they need to climb out somehow. And they can actually drown if you don't put anything in it that they can escape from. And also you don't want to drown anything else that might fall in a, in a pot like that. So at least a good couple of twigs. Underneath, it's advised that you put um, the tray of wood chip. It's, it's not essential, but they really like this kind of substrate in order to, um, yeah, pupate it really. And it just saves them pottering around, really wasting energy trying to find um, the right place to do it. And so that's what's advised. And you can have as many of these as you like in your garden. You can just tuck them away in a corner. But um, obviously this isn't probably something you would advise for somebody with a balcony only might be a bit um a bit on the stagnant side not the most beautiful water feature but <laughs> the fact is you know that it's there in the corner of your garden and um you're creating food for other things lots of other things for deep for deep these kind of things and and you're creating pollinators too because all guys are great pollinators um so we are sort of heading into quite a dry dry looking spring i don't know what the forecast is for uh, next week and onwards but um, obviously we've got migrants coming back here in Dines which is swallows and martins really obviously desperately need mud in order to make their own nests as we know if we don't have any rain point is they're going to have to search for, for longer in order to get get mud the right consistency but what they need to build their own nests so I um, I propose you may all get a big stick out and stir a muddy patch up if it's really dry, which um, which may well help. And I have known people do this and it does work. It's, it's um, not just a crazy idea. Blackbirds, if you've ever felt a blackbird's nest, it's really dense, really heavy. They do weave a lot of material in and stick it down with mud. Um, and they're prolific breeders. They can have five 
broods a year, quite often they'll build a new nest each time. So they'll need lots of mud. So if it is particularly dry, you know, it just is an experiment out of curiosity. See if it works in your garden, because these guys have, you know, flown all the way from Africa and it would be a, such a shame, <laughs> not the blackbirds, I mean, but, you know, the, the others, if they get here and then they can't find enough mud, well, that would be a shame, I think. So this is my last slide. It's just um, the ultimate goal of some baby swallows eating a dragonfly that you've allowed to grow in your pond and uh, or other water feature and uh, they're sitting in a lovely muddy nest from the puddle that you've created. Oh I just wanted to say actually I put um, the buzz club on the bottom of these links here. They're the people who really created the hoverfly lagoon and they they like people to get involved in citizen science a lot and they're a really interesting group. Yeah, there's also a few other links on there, just, just things that I thought might interest people. And if you want to go global, then Breaking Boundaries, it's a Netflix film. It really does tell you about sustainability and um, all the things that we need to do. Uh, and water is a, a major factor in that. So yeah, that's the, uh, that comes to the end of our talk. <laughs>